November of 2019, Kevin Shea was hired as Framingham's new Director of Planning and Economic Development. His resume includes 14 years as Executive Director of Economic and Community Development in Taunton, where he headed up all development activities for the city. And before that, he was Director of Community and Economic Development in Barnstable, Executive Director of the Pawtucket, Rhode Island Redevelopment Agency, and Principal City Planner in Quincy. Kevin holds an undergraduate degree in urban studies and political science from Canisius College in Buffalo, New York, and a master's degree in urban affairs from Boston University. Welcome, Kevin, and thank you. It's a pleasure to have you here today. Thank you, Audrey. Thanks for inviting me. Kevin, when you first took this position in Framingham, what was it that you were looking forward to most uh, when you were hired into this role? I saw Framingham as a city, then a town, but now a city uh, really on the move in terms of its commercial and business development. Uh, and just really wanted to be a part of that. I could just see the city growing and that there were a lot of opportunities here uh, you know, for myself to be part of that and was uh, very enthusiastic about, uh, about coming here and uh, speaking with the mayor and being involved in this whole process. So let's talk a little bit about some of the um, uh, vision that you might have for different parts of Framingham uh, and how you've been progressing with those. And, and I'd like to start, uh, for example, with the downtown, downtown Framingham. What is your vision for downtown Framingham? What's the vision that you have been uh, kind of buying into and, and, and leading efforts in? I think the major vision is, is continuing to work with the, the transit oriented district. Um, that, uh, uh, that district there, uh, we're starting to see the benefits from, for example, the Alta Union House. Uh, I'd like to see that expand, uh, more businesses, uh, come in around the train station, around the TOD, and actually get more residents in downtown, or especially in the TOD district to support the, uh, small businesses downtown. I think that's one of the, uh, the, the, uh, one of the visions that, that somebody had the vision years ago to put into place. I'd like to continue that. Also look for, for resources for arts and entertainment uh, district or, or buildings in downtown and, and, and really build that up. And the other thing too, is I think to put in place or to at least research, um, putting in uh, shared office space, uh, similar to uh, uh, an organization down in New Bedford called Groundworks. And also there's one uh, called uh, Entrepreneurship for All up in Lowell. I think those are two examples where a lot of young entrepreneurs who don't lot, have a lot of resources and money to start off can, can really jump in and get some, some cooperative space, uh, share some overhead and that sort of thing. So I think, I, I think having something like that downtown, especially for young entrepreneurs, uh, would be great. So when you say that you're starting to see the benefits of TOD downtown, what are you seeing? How does it look to you? And how far away from me are we from getting where we need to go? I think the Alta Union House is a, is a great example of that. Uh, to my knowledge, they're between 75 and 80% uh, occupied. Uh, I, I see people starting to... Uh, uh, as customers and some of the local businesses in here. I'd like to see more of that. I'd like to see more residents, more people with disposable incomes coming into downtown, being able to spend money. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, also the, uh, the arts and entertainment uh, area would bring people in from other areas and not only Metro West, but uh, other parts of the state, other communities into downtown. Um, I think bringing in, you know, searching out those investors who would come in and invest money in arts and entertainment in downtown, maybe buy some of the uh, buildings that need rehab or some of the vacant uh, buildings in town. Uh, I, I think that would add to the TOD also. Uh, Do you have like a target list of businesses, and arts, arts and cultural organizations and businesses that you're going after to try to lure them into Framingham? Well, there's, there's, I think first of all, it's coming up with the, the resources or the, or, the, or the properties to do that. For example, in Taunton, we had a, a, an entrepreneur actually come up from Fall River, uh, spent a million dollars of his own money to uh, rehabilitate a, uh, an old district courthouse, which is called the district now. Uh, they have a website and everything. Uh, he came in, uh, basically put a million dollars of his own money into that building. Uh, you know, we did some infrastructure improvements around it. Uh, uh, the city council uh, designated the building as an economic opportunity area that would that allowed him to get uh, the 10% abandoned building tax credit. Uh, 
mm-hmm. that sort of thing. So I think I think it's a matter of of, of you know, coming to the plate with whatever resources we can to to, to bring somebody in. Uh, there's also a organization called the Narrows in Fall River that 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 has taken an old building. Are you uh, talking to these organizations and trying to get them to come to Framingham? Not necessarily them to come to Framingham, but 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 to to you know speak with them in terms of how they did it, what are the pitfalls, what are the what are the things that worked. I don't think I don't think either one of those is going to move from either Taunton or Fall River to Framingham. Right. They're, and how do you well find the that. people that are willing to come in and do similar things in Framingham? And and will they are is there enough there to to um, attract them? I, I I think I think so. Uh, I mean, we're you know we're a major municipality in Metro West. Uh, I think it's a matter of a little bit more marketing in terms of of, of, of trying to do that, working a little bit more with the arts uh, arts community that sort of thing. That uh, uh, I think is one of the things we we maybe have to push a little bit more. Uh, but I think trying to find those those type of people. Uh, sometimes it's word of mouth. Sometimes it's having a building that's available that that somebody could maybe purchase at a good price. You know, maybe maybe getting uh, you know do, doing inventories of buildings that uh, somebody could pick up fairly cheaply. For example, the district courthouse in Taunton, uh, the county commission has sold that for twenty thousand dollars. So so the fact that that building was on the market, it was available, you know, it was fairly cheap. Uh, that attracted somebody in to to be able to spend their own private money. Uh, well, so you're talking about maybe more residents, r- residents living downtown Framingham, more businesses coming in. If, for more residents to come in, uh, would they require apartments? Are you looking at condos? Are you looking at homes? Where do you see more housing coming in? Because there's been a lot of new growth in housing in the last couple of years and a lot of units in the pipeline. And there's resistance to having even more. So, so where do you see that going in terms of residential in downtown? I, I think because we're, we're out of the Boston area, uh, I think just the availability and the market and the rent prices uh, will attract people, especially people working in some of the larger uh, businesses, some of the younger people working at the TJ Maxx and the Bose and the MathWorks and that sort of thing. Um, I, I think it's so expensive to move back towards the Boston area mm-hmm. that, that, that the prices in Framingham become very attractive especially for those, for those younger people who are, who are either now working or, or going to work at the, uh, some of our larger, larger companies. So you think rental is really the key for downtown? I do. I do. I do. And, and I, think, I think it's that, that disposable income. Uh, a lot of young folks now, they work a lot of hours. They want to come home. They don't necessarily want to cook. They want to go to a restaurant. Uh, they want to be able to bring their dry cleaning and, 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 and do their grocery shopping and, and, and things uh, right when they either get off the train or come back from work. Um, I, I think the just the pricing right now in the in the Framingham market uh, is, is something that's attractive to, to to bring people in, especially young young working people. Do you think that we need the city needs more rental units built, or are there enough right now that have already been built? Well, I, I think right now, uh, as a lot of these are starting to be rented up, uh, I, I think. It's starting to. It's starting to. We're starting to have an indicator right now. I think it's a little, little uh, too early to tell in terms of some of these are rented up a little bit more, uh, like the Alta Union House, that mm-hmm. that sort of thing. Um, but irregardless, you've got the I one think, on one thirty five, and then you've got the Fountain Street uh, property. Yeah, uh, you've four. got the one that Vios uh, uh, just built across from the Memorial Building. Yeah, I, I think I think right now it, it's it's waiting to see uh, how fast those those do, do get rented up. You know, if if uh, especially younger younger working people are starting to see Framingham as a real viable alternative to some of the more expensive suburbs or or to Boston proper. So mm-hmm. I think it's a matter of, it, it, I think that's going to tell fa- fairly shortly. I think we're going to start to get a good indicator fairly shortly on on, on these being rented up. The Alta Union House was the first one uh, and it looks like they're doing fairly well. Mm-hmm. So I think it's, it's a matter of- But you have a lot of other apartments that aren't rented yet, but, and now on top of that, you have a city council that voted for an apartment moratorium and the mayor who's just uh, indicated uh, the preference for a veto of that, which will then be voted again by the council. If that doesn't pass, if, if, the, v, if the moratorium holds, 
Is that something you're concerned about for downtown or for the city overall? Yes, both. 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 How would you say, let's, let's talk about what you're concerned about downtown within moratorium and then in the rest of the city. Well, I think in, in, in terms of downtown, um, it's, it's, it's going to create a lot of indecision in, 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 in fluctuation, I think, for any, any other investors coming in. And I, and I think overall, broadly with the city, uh, I, th I think it gives a little bit of a, um, a, a vibe to investors that um, uh, the city may be a little on the unfriendly bus business, not being very business friendly uh, overall. Um, I think, I think on the downtown level and, and just in, in, in terms of the, uh, the city itself, I think it just, it just gives, I think it just gives off the wrong message to, uh, investors. So your biggest concern is messaging. The it is. It is. I mean, these investors are investing uh, a lot of money, millions of dollars and, uh, you know, uh, having to get construction loans and, right. Uh, a lot of money on on soft costs in terms of engineering and legal fees and traffic studies and that sort of thing. Right. I think I think they're going to be very very reluctant to even spend some of those soft costs up front. And them. what do you say to the residents who've been concerned about the impact of such tremendous growth over such a short period of time on the infrastructure, traffic, quality of life, etc.? Is there a balance there that you can that you can strike uh, or or not? Is it one or the other? I, I think there is a balance. Um, I think a lot of the uh, uh, what I've seen in the uh, the moratorium really addresses uh, what was done in the past, as opposed to uh, what affects any new growth will have on the future. And uh, the the other thing is too that uh, there there are checks and balances and and uh, permitting and, and things in place where any developer, a residential developer, multifamily unit developer has to come in. They just can't do things for the most part by right. I mean, there are checks and balances, site plan review, planning boards, zoning board of appeals, uh, special permits, things like that, that, that a lot of these boards and commissions can look at every project on a project by project basis. You know, is it, is it something that fits in? Maybe something that doesn't fit in? Uh, something may, that may need mitigation? I think we can do all those things now. Uh, okay, and so with this coming forward and you concerned about downtown, let's look at the rest of the city. People are always concerned about traffic. They're always concerned about the impact on the schools. Uh, what do you say to that? Well, I think the traffic, I mean, the traffic is good and bad. I, I, I think that uh, uh, the businesses, small businesses, as well as the larger businesses want traffic. Those are their customers. Those are, those are the people who come to their stores and their businesses, whether they're small businesses downtown or some of the larger or medium-sized businesses out on Route 9, Worcester Road. Um, a, lot of, a lot of the major traffic issues also are on roads that are controlled by the state. Um, so I, I think a lot of the traffic issues are basically issues that the, uh, the, the state and none of us can speak for the state, but, uh, a lot of those, a lot of those roads, a lot of the traffic problems, a lot of the congestion, those, those are things I think that, that, that in the preview of the state that we just can't right now, right now kind of take over. So we well, when you, when you say that, um, you're probably referring to things like Route 9 and Route 30 or the Mass Pike. Um, but, but when you look at roads like Edgell Road and Old Connecticut Path and Hamilton and, uh, you know, the roads right off of Route 9 over by the apartments and the reservoir, um, you know, you're looking at some major traffic problems, failing intersections, that have just uh, been worse with increased volume. So I, I'm wondering if you're looking, have you looked at any of the traffic studies that have been done in the past? Are you gonna be leading the studies that have to be done going forward if they are mandated during a moratorium that may hold? My understanding that uh, DPW would be looking at the, uh, at the traffic issues and the traffic studies. Um, but, I, but I think independent of that, that uh, a lot of those issues could be dealt with without necessarily putting a moratorium in place. Uh, don't necessarily disagree that those have to be looked at. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the question is, do, do you need a moratorium to, to go ahead and do that? Or, or can you just go ahead and do that anyway? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the industrial park. Uh, there's, what do you see happening there and in the 990 area where Staples had its headquarters and, and is still 
owns still owns that property, correct? Yeah, the I, I think the uh, well, I call it the tech the tech park. Right. Uh, you know, I, I think that that's that's doing very well. We uh, uh, once or twice a month we go on the uh, Mass Econ, which we belong to a website where they uh, where they highlight a lot of the properties and some of the space up there is really not new space. Well, it's new, but it's sublet space up there. Mm -hmm. uh, it looks like people are staying, but they're downsizing a little and sub subletting mm -hmm. some of their space. Right. And I think that's going to continue to happen. Uh, I don't think people are just walking away or abandoning their space. I think they're just downsizing a little in, in turning to subletting their space. Um, but, you know, every indication is that's, you know, that, that area is still going pretty well. Uh, I think like to see some more, services up there that service the workers, you know, maybe more, uh, you know, restaurants and, 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 and just service oriented business up there. Uh, we, we, in Taunton, we had a similar situation. The, uh, uh, the business park folks, especially some of the larger business were always looking for things to do, new restaurants and that sort of thing. So I think, I think we, we could try to complement that. I know things are, s are slow a little bit, especially with the, uh, the, uh, the pandemic in terms of, uh, you know, new restaurants coming in, people struggling to keep what they have. But I think in addition to keeping what we have at the tech park, you know, bringing in services to kind of sprinkle around that area, give, give workers, uh, you know, some more amenities up there. Uh, do you have, is there something that you're hoping to do there that you've been excited about? Something that you're looking forward to maybe bringing in new? Well, I, I think it's a matter of, of, of looking to see some of the trends on some of the restaurants and that and, and their willingness to come up to that area. Uh, haven't done extensive research on that, but but in, in terms of just a vision or an idea, you know, to do, to put into place. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, All right. Let's talk a little bit about uh, uh, 135 between Ashland and Natick. What are you going to do with that? I I... In my mind, I, I, I see that as a, as a, a priority area. Uh, two things. 135 is a gateway coming in from both, both ends to the, uh, to the city, to the central business district. Mm -hmm. uh, I, you have a lot of properties that are underutilized, uh, kind of a mix, a mix of different uses there. Uh, I think we can do two things. One, create a gateway coming in from both ends on 135 to the city mm -hmm. and to draw a stronger connection going back out from downtown, you know, making, making downtown much more visible in the focal point. And I think, I think uh, dealing with the, although the opportunity areas uh, uh, zones in the state and the country have been a little slow, you know, we have part of 135 in that area in the opportunity zones. Which um, part is that the part closest to Natick? Or yeah. Yeah, that would, the, that would be east of east and southeast of downtown. Okay. Um, but I think that area there in, in, in the city through the planning board, uh, I believe a year or, or two years ago, uh, paid for, uh, it was the planning board who did it, paid for a study that RKG Consultant did. And one of the things, they did many things, but one of the things they did was outline, they're calling it, they're calling it South Framingham. But basically it's that, it's that Waverly Street, you know, Bishop Beaver, that, that, that whole, that whole area there. Mm -hmm. um, so when I you think, say make it a gateway, what does that look like? What does a gateway look like? And does it extend the whole length from Natick to Ashland or is it just when you, where you enter or exit? Well, I, I don't think it has to be the whole way, both to Natick or, or the whole way to Ashland. But I, I, but I think in the, in the general downtown area where as you come in from Ashland, maybe not right from the, right from the town border or from the town border in Natick, but a little closer to downtown, maybe in a, a two or three block radius from downtown, uh, deal with some of those properties, some of those, you know, commercial properties that need, need attention. Uh, and that would be bringing in private investors also to look at, look at some of the uh, properties, uh, what they can be used for. Uh, maybe if they could get some of these properties at a good price where they can invest their own money in. Uh, but I think that, to me, to me, that's a, that, that's a priority area. And, and I think to the city going back, I believe the RKG study went back to 2019. Mm -hmm. It looked like it, it looks like it has been a priority area for the, for the city for, for at least a couple of years, if not longer. So you talk a lot about with downtown and along 135, just in separate categories, you talk a lot about investors coming in. 
Um, what's going to attract them? How do you know you'll be able to get them in and accomplish some of these things? I think one of the things is, is, is defining an area as, as maybe like an urban renewal area or, or, or a planning area, very similar to what they did with the, uh, the uh, transit oriented district a few years ago. Mm -hmm. And then, and then basically, you know, whether, whether that's creating incentives, whether that's going after uh, infrastructure grants like MassWorks grant to provide the uh, infrastructure there. Um, in, in especially rezoning, uh, a big part of the RKG, uh, uh, they, they laid it out into short-term, medium-term, and long-term goals. The short-term goal was a lot of rezoning in that area. And I think that's something, that's something that, that could be done as an incentive to bring in investors. Mm -hmm. it, it doesn't necessarily always take you, you giving in financial incentives. I think, I think permitting incentives and zoning incentives uh, we could work on that right away. Uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be financial in, 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 uh, in incentives. Mm -hmm. Okay. How about um, Route 9? That's a challenge in itself on Route 9. And we have the same thing between Natick uh, and Southborough, actually. Uh, a stretch of, of a state road with a lot of businesses that have closed, maybe a forthcoming glut in office space on and off uh, route nine and in the immediate proximity of route nine. What are your thoughts about helping to spruce up and invigorate route nine? Uh, it's, you're right. That, I mean, that is a tough one uh, for a couple of reasons. I think a lot of retail and some of the box stores were having problems prior to the pandemic. I think the pandemic just exasperated that. Uh, and I think as far as the office space goes, a lot of people like municipalities are having people working at home, you know, rather than paying rents in, in, in class A, class B office, office space. Uh, they're going out and buying laptops and tablets and things that they have to do that, you know, to work from home it is, especially some of these larger companies have the technology to do that. Um, that's a tough one, I think, because, because of the market and, and not just because of the pandemic, but I think that that's really, exasperated the situation. Um, it's, I, I think it's something we just keep an eye on uh, when any properties maybe come up, maybe they could be repurposed, maybe not to office space, but maybe for something else or a different mm -hmm. type of office space. Uh, same with retail. I mean, there were a whole list of, of retailers prior to the pandemic who were uh, either in the process of closing or closing. So I think it's just keeping an eye on that real estate to just to see who's coming in buying it and who's, who's backfilling. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm hoping that uh, some of these maybes, you know, the maybes, the uncertainties of what could happen uh, can turn into or, or a vision that you'd share uh, and maybe some outreach that you uh, have had some success with or that you're planning uh, to really get the wheels in motion. But of course you have to deal with changes in the, uh, the new normal as well in, in making that happen. Um, and that, that's a challenge in itself. But so we've talked a little bit about these business areas, but what about the residential neighborhoods? You know, you have many different neighborhoods in the community that are begging for some kind of um, uh, help, whether it be in Saxonville, you have a block of town owned, pro city owned properties. Uh, you've got a Knobscot development uh, in the Knobscot Plaza. Uh, you have all kinds of uh, like neighborhood concerns over areas that need improvement or attention? Um, I, I think through zoning and, and uh, uh, permitting, in fact, you, you mentioned Knobscot, and I think Knobscot is a, is, is a great example of that, is, is how zoning and permitting, you know, transformed that, that, that neighborhood, that area. Um, and then, and again, the zoning and the, and the permitting, um, I think works. I mean, it has worked. It's worked for the TOD and it's worked for Knobscot. I think so can, you want to see some zoning changes in neighborhoods that will do what? Well, I, I think in some of the neighborhoods that, that are, uh, maybe make them conducive more to mixed use, uh, especially some of those areas, uh, say, off of, off of Waverly, off of 135, that kind of go into some of the residential neighborhoods, you know, maybe rezone some of those commercial properties. Or, or maybe create some buffers through zoning where, where it, you, you don't go from a hard commercial or industrial use right, right to a residential use. Mm -hmm. You have some buffer there. Uh, and again, that could be done through zoning and permitting. Okay. Uh, 
I'd like to hear your view on uh, what's going to be happening if the MCI prison is closed. Uh, there's been some talk about the women's prison being closed, and that's a large, large parcel of land. What kind of conversations are you having about that? Well, that's that's been speculation at this point. So I don't think we've had really conversations in terms of with the state or, or, or what the state's going to do. But in terms of when that happens, I think I think creating a whole just a whole plan for that whole area. I think you can't do it piecemeal. You have to create a whole plan for that area. It's it's, it's a large area. Uh, I think you have to do an urban renewal plan and then and then really promote that urban renewal plan and advertise that urban renewal plan out to uh, private developers. Um, I don't think you can do that piecemeal. I think you have to you have to attack it uh, as a plan and in. It's going to take private investors to come in to 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 redo that property. That's mm -hmm. a big property. Uh, Kevin, you've uh, had to deal with uh, keeping a an eye on taxes as well, the tax rolls, and that's a challenge in Framingham to keep more properties on the tax rolls because the city has a tendency to attract a lot of uh, entities that take properties off the tax rolls and has a very large presence of that. What, what can you do about that? Well, that's, that, that's a tough question. I, I think. Some people say it's because of the commercial tax split rate, but. Well, I, I think a lot of the, a lot of the users of some of these properties are probably nonprofits and that sort of thing who, who, uh, come in and, and it, it's, it's just what the stra tax structure is. Uh, if they come in, I, I think the way, to do, the way to do it is, is, is basically, you know, get those, get those property values up uh, by, as we mentioned about maybe mixed use in some of those neighborhoods and that, get it, getting those properties uh, maybe to a point where again, you can get a business or a developer in there. Uh, and, and again, that's, it's nothing against a nonprofit or anything. But but you know they have a right to go in and and, and, and purchase a property and, and you know in essence it's off the tax rolls. Uh, it's very it's very difficult or or, or you know we're in a difficult role I think to, to to deal with that. If somebody comes in and purchases a property, they can they have a right to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, let's talk just briefly in the in the remaining time about your department. You're undergoing a, a reorganization. Your department. What's it going to look like? How different is it going to look from the way it was when you came on board? And uh, what are the pros and cons of the changes that you foresee coming? Well, one of the major changes is uh, up to the charter. The uh, this was formerly three different separate divisions. Uh, we call them silos. And what we're, what we're trying to do is is take all these five different uh, create five different functions, uh, a planning a planning function, a uh, uh, economic development, a permitting, uh, and a, a conservation function, all under one roof. And what we're trying to do also is cross train staff. So if you're an investor, a developer, a business owner, or or a resident, you could come one place and get everything. I mean, I, I could pull in staff from all those different boards and commissions to to meet with people. The other thing too is that we saw the benefits that we're trying to unify the which wasn't done before: uh, website, financial management, outreach, uh, 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 staff support, and and to me, a real stronger, dedicated economic development function. I think that's yeah. that's a real that's a real key. Mm -hmm. uh, the other things were in place. I think they were just separate and, and, and siloed, a little, siloed a little bit. Uh, I think having that economic development function within within the department is really, in, in my mind, a real key element to the to the department. Okay. Well, um, good luck with all of that. And Kevin, you know, I want to thank you for joining me today. Uh, all eyes are on you. Uh, everybody is hoping and longing to see how the economic recovery and the economic development in Framingham will evolve. Uh, so we'll have, you'll have to come back and give us some updates uh, as we move along. Uh, but I do want to thank you uh, for sharing your time today and, and uh, some of your thoughts about where we're going and how we're going to get there. So thank you very much for that. Well, thank you. Thank you for the invitation. I enjoyed it. Thank you. Thanks, Kevin. My next guest is Courtney Thrayen. She's the executive director of Downtown Framingham, Inc. 
an officer in the Navy. She led divisions in administration, navigation, medical, and auxiliary engineering, engineering through two overseas deployments. And she spent three years instructing naval science courses and training midshipmen at the Massachusetts Maritime Academy. She spent four years processing VA disability claims for homeless veterans and severely injured veterans just before coming to downtown Framingham, Inc. She has a master's in public policy from the University of Massachusetts, Dartmouth, and a master of city planning degree from Boston University. Downtown Framingham, Inc. is a nonprofit which is focused and on and dedicated to serving both people and local businesses by creating a vibrant and socially engaged area in the Metro West with its focus on Framingham. And Courtney's at the heart of it all. So thank you so much for joining me, Courtney. It's always a pleasure to have you here on the show. And I keep having you back and, and trying to catch up on everything that's going on because there's a lot looking forward and there's a lot that's happened up to date. So we'll have to uh, try and cover it all. Yes, I'm excited to be here. And thank you for checking in. It's a very dynamic, evolving area. So Absolutely. it's hard to encapsulate all of that. I don't know how you do it sometimes because I hear about all the things that you have going on. And I'm not sure how you keep them all going. A lot of balls in the air at one time. But uh, right now, downtown is kind of in the midst of the plan for transit oriented development. So how do you see that plan working out so far? That's a great uh, question and inter you know, introductory question, Audrey. So thank you for uh, bringing that up. So the Transit Oriented Development Plan, Action Plan, that is, it came out in 2015. And I recently, you know, dusted it off and I, you know, released a newsletter um, to my 2,500 constituents or so. And I was going through what this action plan was directing and what it entailed and how that was being fulfilled and coming to fruition uh, in the downtown area. And it really looked at attracting investment and ways to do that. But when people think about the plan, what do they visualize in their mind? And I think it's more on the housing side and less of the transportation infrastructure side, if you will. But those elements are all in there. So on the housing side, the transit oriented development plan really it states directly, you know, prove the market first. And when they say prove the market, make sure you have people that are ready to spend money to rent or live in if it was condominium kind of condos, live in, you know, these units, apartment units, uh, typically above businesses, mixed right. use whole first floor is commercial with mixed use on top and 20 to 40 units it's said. And so when I look at that and I think of what I see, some things come to mind and I don't think they get enough recognition, but the Amsden building above Fortacao at 101 Concord street to Kendall street, that is an example of 26 units going in above one floor of commercial and those were immediately filled within the first six months. You I'm not sure people who drive through downtown are even aware of the fact that there's brand new apartments above the Fotokao restaurant. Uh, you know, that's not something that it was, a, it wasn't a brand new building. So it's not something that people see automatically and say, oh, there's, there's new apartments, but are you, so you're seeing those and you're seeing, you know, the, the freestanding separate apartment buildings, but there's a lot of new residential. Yes. And so that plan really spoke to using the, the rehabilitation and the retrofits. Like at 82 Concord Street, there were nine that were put in. And then you see there was a separate project at 68 South Street where there were 16 units. And then next door to that right now, the, the 16 units were unveiled in 2019 and they were filled pretty quickly. And then right next to that right now, they're doing construction on eight more units at 74 South Street. Um, and those the cool thing with the new units is they're going to have the energy efficiency features and the solar panels and everything of that nature. And then in the transit oriented development plan to get to your point that I know you want to get to, um, it spoke to these assemblage assemblage parcels where you have larger, it didn't really speak to them, but it illustrated them per se. And so it illustrated probably three projects, one of, you know, a hypothetical at Pearl street, a hypothetical at Howard street and a hypothetical at the Hollis Court area where we're public plumbing is. So there were three hypothetical parcels and I think I added it up and the housing units all together were under 600 for those three areas there. And that's really what it spoke to. 
Um, and so one of those hypotheticals came to life. That would be Ulta Union House there at the Howard and Concord um, area. And then there were some that were much larger. Um, Modera, which is the old Harley Davidson 266 Waverly, that's 270 units. And so I think that was a little bit bigger than what was in the TOD hypothetical. But again, that was just, it's an action plan with some hypotheticals in it. Um, and then you have, you have that, and then you have the Fountain Street project was, I believe, 258 units. Um, and so those are fairly larger, um, just adding those up in the 600 that we're looking at there. So, I mean, you're going to exceed that with what we have. And then you have, my Main Streets district does cover the Buckley. The Buckley, when I toured it a couple of weeks ago, it definitely had your traditional apartment feel. They were more uh, laid out and spacious, a little more breathing room. Whereas when I was in the Modera a few weeks ago, it was very jazzed up and urban and had all the bells and whistles of excitement, basically, and kind of that busyness that you would feel, whereas the Buckley was a little more calm and um, we're on the banks, you know, overlooking Farm Pond. And Is so, Modera occupied? Which project? Modera. Um, the Modera, they, so I'll go through all of them. So Modera just started leasing this summer and I think they um, just started leasing in July actually. So they're in one month. So they're sort of in the infancy of their leasing stage. At a pretty um, tough time right now to start leasing, I would imagine. That's correct. Um, so I believe they're at like 10 units or something of that nature, but that was a few weeks ago. So, you know, they opened in a very tough time. Um, it's interesting with the Modera, they don't have a pool inside, but they have these meditation water features, which are pretty neat. If you ever get a chance, I would recommend anyone that wants to go see it, go check it out because it has some really cool features um, if you're into that. And then the Buckley, which is 210 units, I toured that, like I said, and then that one was 48% leased when I was there. 35% occupied, 48% leased. And so they're about halfway. They started, the Buckley, they started leasing just before the pandemic. I want to say, but like late February, early March, they started leasing. So they've been dealing with that. They're actually getting at the Buckley a lot of uh, Framingham homeowners that are downsizing and want to move into that environment there. And then they have this separate, so Modera, and the Buckley, um, they're not really mixed use. I mean, the Buckley has a restaurant over to the side. It's not your first, it's not like Photo Cow, where there's the first floor with the residential above. Um, right. And then Alta Union House, the first one I brought up, that's at Concord and Howard. So that, I would say the end of July, that one was 86.25% leased, and that was after a year. And, um, they do have a small commercial 2,600 square feet space there that isn't occupied. I was trying to find this real estate listing and was having some trouble. Um, so I think they're being very picky about what business they bring in there, but they are moving towards full occupancy. And it's very hard to have 100% full occupancy in any apartment complex as people are transient and they're moving back and forth. So would you say that getting back to the initial statement that the housing market has proven out it's yeah. definitely proven the first, um, the 20 to 40 unit example with the retrofit and the rehab, it's definitely proven that. Um, I would love to see more of that keep going and not miss any more opportunities for that. I know there is possibilities for more of that um, at 105 Irving Street. Um, I don't know too much about it, but I know there are people looking at that, wanting to do mixed use. And I know that area could really use more boots on the ground and people there and that commercial on the first floor just to help make the area feel safer. Um, and all of these projects, they bring with them infrastructure improvements as well. And so, um, whether it's- on Fountain Street? Say again? Fountain Street, what impact will that have? Fountain Street, the impact, so I didn't talk about Fountain Street too much. They're supposed to open, I believe, 2021. Um, so the, the impact fees that I was talking about, those are, what the developers work with the planning board and say, you know, improve the infrastructure in the area, things of that nature. So I believe at Fountain Street, they've done some pretty intense remediation work 
on environmental concerns that are in the farm pond area there, the one that's adjacent and abuts that property. Um, also with Fountain Street that you bring that up is important is because we have a lot of individuals, dentists and apartments. One reason why TOD works is because dentists and apartments, and this is in the study, is that those are the den dentists and by Jack Zabby there, if you're not aware, those have a waiting list. So those have been doing very successful when the TOD project came out. And that really gave the city a lot of confidence to bring in these other projects. The residents at Denison, though, I know from speaking to them, they would run across and run over the CSX tracks just to get to Farm Pond and get their work out in. And I've actually seen residents that I know from Alta Union House on Fountain Street going over to Farm Pond and coming back around. So with the project at um, 58 Fountain Street, they're looking at doing some sort of uh, walking walkway bridge, connector bridge over the tracks there, I believe, um, to help facilitate that connection to downtown and then also create better use, recreational use of Farm Pond and hopefully economic use as well. Um, there is a boat ramp at Farm Pond that's off of Mount Waits uh, just before the juvenile court. Like if you're coming, you'll miss it. If you're coming from Cushing Park, you won't miss it. So you have to know where it is. But I mean, that's an opportunity that's underutilized for sure. So I mean, who's looking at putting a walking uh, like bridge over? So the Parks and Rec Department is partnering with uh, the Solomon Foundation to really bring this vision to life. And I know this is something as well that the group that's looking at the Community Preservation Act wants to also capitalize upon and you know, bring those amenities to the area of, you know, really connecting Farm Pond because you have this disruptor in there, these rail yards, and um, they've really done just like a, putting the highway through Greenwich Village that Jane Jacobs was totally against. Those rail yards really did that to downtown, and so we want to find ways to really better connect that and overcome any of the environmental negative externalities of the, the rail yard there. I mean, we have to have our freight moved around, but there are other um, means, you know, complicating right. factors. In the I way. heard you say that some of the units, uh, the, the apartments were, for example, you would say 85% leased, but 82% occupied. What, when, what is the discrepancy there between leased and occupied? Basically, great segue. A lot of the residents that are looking at these places, we'll speak to Alta Union House, when I spoke with them, I think it was 86.25% lease and 75% occupied. And so that discrepancy comes from they, when they started last summer, last June, July, you know, leasing units, they were able to pre-lease units before they were even showing them. And me, yes, maybe people were doing virtual tours, but people were signing up and leasing apartments because they were living in other states. And so they weren't able to physically move in yet, or maybe they had you know, sign the lease and they're counting that as lease because it's been signed, but there is that, I got to move out of my old place and, and get everything into the new place. So, but I do know a lot of people were, that's another segue to your questions, but you know, you have Bose and some of the other companies and they're like TJX and MathWorks and Natick and they're recruiting talent from across the country to come to Framingham. And so there is gonna be a little delay and they wanna make sure they get their spot at this apartment. And one thing that Modera and the Buckley and also Union House, one of their projects that works well to get these units filled is um, a prefer preferred employer program, which is a program that if you work at certain employers, Sanofi, Genzyme, TJX, MathWork, et cetera, then they will give you a discount on your rent if you live at those respective uh, residential places. I see that. So how many people are um, actually coming in um, and, and, and talking about the quality of life in Framingham, that they're enjoying the quality of life? And, and do you see a discrepancy between what they're experiencing and what the perception is? So people that are coming into Framingham, right when the pandemic had in, hit in April, I had been doing a lot of like online games and I had a lot of residents actually from Alta Union House playing my online bingo and my online scavenger hunt and my gift card giveaways. And I had spoken to a few of them before the pandemic. Um, I had a board meeting at Sofa Cafe 
and they had mentioned they just really love the nooks and crannies and the cultural history of Framingham and just the architecture of Framingham. And I usually do a cafe crawl every year um, around this time and, and really speaking to the architecture and how everyone was just so bold and bullish and innovative back in the um, 1880s, 1890s, when the downtown development really got going and they really said, we need to do capital investments and streetlights and sewer and all of that. And so um, I know the residents from what I've told, you know, when they've talked to me, they've been pretty cool about everything. Some of them do would like to see the trains be a little quieter. The CSX train has a louder horn than the MBTA train. So it's really the freight train. Um, or sometimes if it's for Modera, they can feel a little bit more reverberation than you can at Alta Union House. It's more the, the sound, but they've done a good job with the soundproofing. But um, I know the neighbors do appreciate, like we have our eight, pre-pandemic, we had eight arts and entertainment venues going that were really lively and they had tons of weekly events that we were always broadcasting. So mm -hmm. they definitely appreciated that. Um, per, yeah, perceptions are very interesting um, in Framingham. And, you know, I can talk to on Blue in the face about like, oh, this business is hiring and they're exceeding expectations, you know, and they had their best sales month ever. And so I think, um, that, you know, with everything that's gone on this summer with Black Lives Matter and all of this, you know, be anti-racist and be bold and brave. And so I think it's very important um, for the, the people that are coming in, they don't have these preconceived notions. They may or may not about race and different immigration and, and things of that nature. So, but it is something that I feel pause with, with the um, greater Framingham community, specifically the people that I interact with. When we survey the businesses every winter, I ask them, has the perception of Framingham changed in a way that's like helped your business or not helped your business? It's kind of a hard question, but I ask it through the lens of the business owner. I don't ask it through my lens because the people that I talk to, they're more white, you know, to be frank. And they're not necessarily shopping downtown, although they're just much like you, they're very interested in what's happening downtown and they may be an elected official or involved in city hall government. So um, so from the perspective of the business owners and their own sales and their revenue, um, the perception of downtown, it has improved over the years. And when the business owners think about perception, they think of it not through the eyes of any cultural or racial injustice, but more about how safety, the, the perception of safety downtown. Um, and do they see it as being safe? Like, what is that perception? In 2018 versus, so in 2018, about 63% of the businesses said that perception was a significant obstacle. And a lot of that was due, that perception, 43, 42% actually said that significant obstacle was due to crime. Um, and then that was in 2018. And then in 2019, only 9% said that the perception of downtown was a significant obstacle that was impacting their sales and their revenue. That's um, a big change from one year. That is a big change. Um, they said that the crime was, uh, was like 42%, like I said, thought it was a significant obstacle, 42% um, in 2018. And then 18% felt 18% of the businesses, about 40 businesses, um, felt that it was a significant obstacle in 2019. So it went from 42% to 18%, like a really major bad issue. But on the flip side, um, more business, almost the amount of businesses that thought crime was a minor obstacle doubled from 2018 to 2019, from 25 to 52%. So it's right, still obstacle, even, even going from 42% to 18% is a big improvement. It is as far as like the tremendous you know, improvement. My business is dying, and my customers are afraid to walk in the door. Yeah. So, so and, um, and okay, and what do you attribute this to? And and do you expect that it's going to continue to get better? I really pushed last year trying to work with the community partners, the city, the other social services, trying to have a sense of um, peaceful coexistence. And so the business owners in Berkeley Square, there's actually a lot of foot traffic in Berkeley Square, and um, just. So that helps with safety, just the people walking from Southeast Framingham and coming to those shops specifically in that Arlington Street area, walking over. So that does actually help with safety. Um, but just creating the sense of peaceful coexistence, like I said, 
and making sure, you know, people are calm. And I think the secret to success there, it's not rocket science. It's really like when we had the, the ambassadors or the team that we hired last year, their job was to walk around and talk to people, talk to the business owners, talk to the individuals that were spending a lot of time outside and then listen to their stories, make them feel heard and then like hand out water. Um, and unfortunately there's a lot of people that suffer from alcohol misuse in all walks of life and all specters of the workforce and hanging out water is very important in the summer because you don't want to see the ambulance come and you don't know what's happening. It's very scary. So it's really water and conversation at the end of the day that helped. And so this year things have been fairly calm. Um, we have a new restaurant in Berkeley Square called uh, Couscous, which is extremely popular. Uh, Middle Eastern restaurant and they have great falafel and so I know I've talked to that owner a lot and he was sort of getting adjusted and we've also worked with the residents of the elderly affordable housing in Berka Square and listen to their concerns too. Um, and for those people dynamic. watching that's I'm sorry keep going uh, I was just going to say for those people watching could you further define Berka Square not everyone knows exactly what it is. Yes so Berka Square it's basically the heart of it is going to be, um, I think it was police officer Charles Burkus, and he has a garden that's at the intersection of Irving Street and Hollis Street. That would be at the southeast intersection there. Um, it's a T intersection. And I would say it would go probably, it doesn't go super far. It's a little bit commingled with Irving Square, that area, which is kind of an industrial manufacturing area. And I would say um, south of 135, in that zone, probably to where Amazing Things is and Auto Bright to the south, and then to the west, maybe Republic Plumbing, sort of in that Hollows Court area. No further okay, than good. That's helpful. That's very helpful. We only have about five, six minutes left, and I have a lot to cover, so I want to uh, just keep moving along. All right. Thank you for that. What are some of the biggest challenges uh, for the downtown right now, and how is the administration helping or hindering achieve some of those uh, uh, challenges? Uh, or goal. Great question. Um, you know, I think this moratorium has really given me a lot of pause, like the conversations about stopping housing. And I think, you know, workforce housing and affordable housing is very important to downtown and having the ability to move forward and make plans to make that happen. But moreover, the, the conversation with the moratorium, it's really letting the public know what's happening at these meetings because a lot of people you know and i don't blame them they go to their jobs they come home they want to watch something fun on tv and maybe watching a board meeting with the zba or the planning board or city council isn't their idea of fun but it's very important for them to be involved and see what's happening and so i think really engagement is huge and letting people know like we're going to talk about artisan you know industries tonight at the city council subcommittee meeting or tomorrow we're going to talk about traffic calming policies that are going to be happening in Framingham like these are the things that the community needs to engage with and I think when it comes to the information I was sharing earlier like how that process was going and just being like from the city side like being bold and proactive and saying, yes, we're doing the small projects, the TOD action plan said, but we're also bringing in these larger projects. And this is sort of the timeline scope for them. Mm -hmm. And we want you to be part of that discussion. You know, the TOD action plan said for affordable housing, 10% may not, for the larger projects, 10% may not be enough. You might want to bump it up to 15 or 20% for affordable for those projects. And so really getting that mix in there and I was on a webinar last week and it talked about the really big um, gentrified urban cities like Boston where people are going to start in the 2010s, you know, everyone was moving to the city and now the young people are moving back to the suburbs, but places like Framingham that still have that urban feel, that still have the elements of an urban environment. And so with that, you're going to see more demand and there's sort of a notion if you build more housing, it's going to be less expensive, but not if there's all this demand. And so I think you really need to put more regulations in and deed restrictions on to make that happen. The Fair Housing Committee, it needs to meet, like it hasn't met since June of 2019. Like there need to be regular meetings. And so I think with the city council and the city, and we know that the community and economic development or planning and community development is, you know, woefully understaffed. Like instead of saying like, what's your plan? 
Like, let's actually recommend solutions and work together to implement those solutions. Like, I'm working with the city to help with their business grant program. Like, I know it's tough, and the way they're what doing. Are some of the, so, the business grant program, you see that maybe as as an, as a solution. What are some of the solutions you want to work towards? I, I agree oh, with solutions. You. Okay, that was just an example of a project. Um, so, the big things downtown, obviously, structured parking, wayfinding signage. Wayfinding signage is huge. Um, and that's why some of these, like if we were able to do a development at 105 Irving or something with Tedeschi's, we can say for the impact fee, let's increase the lighting, let's get that structured parking in there, let's work towards wayfinding signage is challenging for me because I think you can do intermediary measures and then you can do your parking study and get all your data and make it like, you know, beautiful and permanent, but at least have something in there in the meantime. Yeah. Um, to make that happen. And so, so parking in, is one of them. What any other solutions that you think are critical in the, in the, in the show? I would love to have um, the, the ambassadors come back more full time, oh. have their presence be felt. I don't think that's something like I think this year is strange because of the COVID, but I do feel that that's um, something that needs to. Um, you know, be present. And I know the opioid crisis is still present in the area. And I think a lot of the properties that are available downtown to be purchased, um, they have a lot of issues with contamination and with HVAC issues, which makes them hard to move. So I feel that, you know, finding state and federal programs to really help with that. I know they did some work with um, the federal government to help with the remediation at 105 Irving, for instance. Um, but really finding better ways to promote that because we need more family. The solutions, diversifying the small businesses we have downtown, they're awesome, but we have some vacancies, 20 Concord Street. I'd love to see a drop-in gym down there. We don't have a drop-in gym. Uh, we don't have a public market downtown. I think if we can expand the artisan zoning and get more different types of food artisans downtown, that would be fantastic too. And then there were a lot of conversations about um, 360 Waverly Street, 358 Waverly, and something that is, you know, family fun. There's a lot of adult entertainment. You can do dancing and, you know, drinking into the night, 2 a.m., but places to bring the whole family that isn't just for eating. So activity-centric items would be huge. So big question, and this will be the last question. How can you coordinate your efforts with some of that uh, visionary thinking with the Department of uh, Community and Economic Development and Planning and make sure that you're both in sync in bringing, uh, you know, the right vision, uh, the right solutions uh, to make the downtown successful? That's a great question. Thank you. So every year I release my annual report that really says like, these are our goals for the year. And this is what we're looking to do. And in January, I met with Kevin Shane. We talked about the city's program, sign and facade, et cetera, and how I help facilitate and market those programs to the small businesses. And so every two weeks I work, I have a meeting with Erica Jerem, a deputy director. And then once a month I work with Ala, who does the community outreach for the city. Um, she's the CPO there. So I think continuing to have the conversations with those departments, but, um, and right now when they're understaffed and they're trying their best to hire, I think just helping to get the word out and let them know this is what the community feels and things. And for the people that work in community and economic development, to be mindful of the individuals that live downtown and what their cultural backgrounds are and to be respectful of that and to really embrace it and see life through that lens. Um, I think that's critical and really important because if you're in your office and you're not boots on the ground, you're going to miss out on the dynamics that are actually happening. Yeah. Um, and well, being present at community events on the weekends is huge. Like that needs to always be like, that's community development, Go, being at MetroFest, being at Earth Day Festival. That's really where the, the value is in the trust building. It sounds like you've got the energy and the drive and a lot of good things in motion. So keep up the good work and thank yeah. you so much. I really appreciate you. Yeah. You know, joining me today and uh, looking forward to checking back in with you again in the not too distant future to see about more progress that's been made. So thank you for joining me today, Courtney. All right. Thank you so much, Audrey. I was uh, excited and honored to be here again. Thank you. All right. Take care. I want to thank Kevin Shea for being here today and Courtney Thrayen, both uh, giving us their insights into the economic development of Framingham and with a focus a bit on the downtown area. And I want to thank you for tuning into the Audrey Hall Show, where you will always learn something new.